And now, finally, before moving to questions, uh, we have Luca. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for inviting me. I'm Luca Foschini, co-founder and chief data scientist of Evitation Health. Uh, I was born and raised in Italy, so I don't know much about gambo. I love eating gambo, but I don't think I'm in a position of telling this crowd anything about how to prepare it, so what goes in the recipe. So I'm going to talk about pizza, which we have a lot of opinions on, what should go on it or not. Chicken, not good on pizza, <clears throat> for example. And uh, the idea of this talk is, is really to uh, look at patient or participant generated uh, health data and see uh, how that could be used as real world evidence. So think about that. If you, if you don't see this fitting on your gumbo, think about that as a as pizza that you can alternate with your gumbo. Or maybe we can even come down to use them together with a gumbo pizza. That would be, uh, that would be a great result. <laughs> next. The, how do you, next slide. So at Evidation, uh, we've been working on uh, collecting patient-generated health data for uh, six years now. We have the vision that uh, even real-world data in its most uh, um, like real-world incarnation is still uh, comes from touch points of a patient or a participant with, with center of care, with a system. So it's really sporadic in nature. Uh, the claims EHR that we've seen with the excellent excellent presentation by Aileen and Brandy uh, have shown us that. So we focus on, 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 the, on the other side. Uh, we focus on data that uh, really fills the gaps between those sporadic measurements uh, in the real world data. So continuously collected patient generated health data. And uh, my background is in technology. Before I was in, uh, before I started Evidation, I worked for a few years as a software engineer at Google and ask.com. And so uh, I'm going to talk about patient-generated health data through the dimension of the Vs. Uh, when big data became a thing in technology in the early 2000s, everybody was talking about the Vs of big data. Volume, velocity, variety were the first three. Then people started questioning the certainty of that, so veracity came along. And then finally, there was value, the fifth V. Um, so volume. Um, if you're looking at post-doc recovery of someone uh, who's uh, having a total knee arthroscopy, you can look at it from a claims perspective, which is the top, which is the set of drugs they have taken, plus maybe the PT they have gone through. So we're looking at you know, tens or maybe dozens of data points per year. Or you can look at the bottom part, which is the data we deal with, that even in the most simple example of, uh, in this particular case, commercial, commercial uh, wearable device, uh, uh, heat map that logs for every minute of the day, x-axis for every day of the year, y-axis, how many steps you have taken in that minute. Uh, red means more steps. Uh, you can see that the patterns of physical activity before the uh, uh, procedure came, so bottom left of the graph, uh, were, were very different. So the, 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 the participant here was uh, doing a lot of physical activity in the morning, and then obviously the uh, total knee arthroscopy happened, and uh, there's a blank, and then you see the patterns that are reestablishing themselves towards the end of the year. Uh, so this gives you a much more complete and holistic picture of what happened after surgery, but it's also 0.5 million data points per patient. So if you have that for millions of patients on multiple channels, we're talking about trillions of data points. We're talking about things that you can't store on your laptop, you can't store on the union of the laptops in this room. You need infrastructure like Google to store and analyze, and you need to use systems like AI and machine learning that we've talked about before in how to design analysis. Variety is not something I should uh, spend a lot of time on. Uh, it's been touched upon by Komathi and uh, the excellent speakers before me. But you know, this data really can come from any sources. This is a beautiful infographic from uh, a paper uh, in uh, Science Transactional Medicine of February 2018. Uh, I think there's a lot missing there. There's no uh, patient-generated health data that comes from uh, sources like Facebook or patient like me. There is no uh, patient-reported outcome, and still, that's a lot. So the hope of having a common data model for patient-generated health data is doomed. Let's not wait for it for anytime soon. That's not going to happen. We're not going to use them if we're waiting for common data models. Uh, so finally, for uh, after uh, volume and variety, let's look at, at a V that matters, value. And we have identified at Evidation two uh, uh, main uh, use cases for value of this data. One is uh, basically an upgrade of your standard epidemiology study with new outcomes. So you can compare a population uh, with uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, uh, for example, on the left-hand side of the slide, 
uh, uh, with uh, agent gender mesh controls on dimensions that were not measurable and known before. For instance, the time that it takes for them to fall asleep, that's significantly higher in people with MS, uh, or the sleep duration, or the uh, physical activity. Right hand side, same exercise, comparing of new dimension, new outcomes uh, from, uh, to, between people with diabetes and, uh, and, uh, and the age and gender match control. And you can see that you know, the average number of cardio exercise session is significantly different, which is not surprising, but never quantified and measured to that extent before. The other use case that we really like, and that's specific to the patient-generated health data that we have at uh, Evidation, so uh, time series continuous measurement kind of thing, uh, is that they're really good at picking up on acute events. They're really good at tracking uh, um, change and, and monitoring change over time. So this is a pilot study that we run internally. We're writing up the paper. This is not uh, public data yet. But uh, we have access to a very large population in the millions that shares data uh, and um, is uh, amenable to be asked research question. We ask a uh, research question to this population. Each of these questions is permissioned uh, uh, and, uh, and consented separately together with access to their digital data that we go uh, and, and mix uh, with uh, the survey. And so for, for this population, we ask uh, the very simple question, have you had any medical procedure of surgery since June 2016? To send out to a million people, uh, a few hundreds of thousands responded yes. When you filter out all the small things like wisdom teeth, and you filter out on uh, data density around the event, the self-reported of uh, where that procedure happened, and you select one of the variables that this device has returned to you, which is resting heart rate, you can plot something like this at a population level. Uh, so every data point in this uh, graph is a z-score, uh, is a per patient z-score. So you compute uh, a baseline for a participant on the 60 days before procedure, and then you re-encode uh, their heart rate uh, in terms of z-score with respect to their own baseline, and then you aggregate at a population level. And so this is the first time that we're able to observe on hundreds of people people, uh, well, the effect of uh, weight loss uh, procedure, these are combined procedure, uh, um, is, a, is, a, is a bundle of procedure to um, reduce uh, the size of your stomach uh, in different ways. Um, the effect of weight loss procedure on resting heart rate, with the outcome of interest there is weight loss, uh, but the change in the measure of resting heart rate, which is a good measure of fitness, is something that hasn't been observed before. And uh, the end-to-end -end time to run this study has been less than a month between you know, uh, questionnaire design, permission, data collection, and analysis. So there's uh, an opportunity here to, uh, to, to data collection, to run real world, um, uh, to create real world evidence through prospective data collection, or, or at least prospectively permission data collection that is, wasn't, wasn't there before. Uh, to ARP on the same lines, uh, we think the patient-generated health data blurs the line between RWE and, and clinical trials. The example that we just seen was a case of prospectively permissioned retrospective data. Uh, we can push that line a little bit more on the perspective side of things and have something like the Discovery Project, the Discovery Study, which is the largest observational study in chronic pain launched by uh, Evidation. If you have chronic pain, uh, please uh, uh, check your eligibility. Uh, we're aiming at um, enrolling 10,000 patients and collecting data prospectively for them. So that's, that's creating real-world evidence, but if you work on the protocol of the study, you feel you feel like you're working on a clinical trial protocol, like it's much more similar to a uh, clinical trial kind of way of dealing with data. And in fact, uh, I was lucky enough to be part of uh, the Clinical Trial Transformation Initiative um, um, uh, creation of guidelines for using a mobile uh, technology in clinical trials that were just released yesterday. And uh, I think that a lot of the things, a lot of the findings, a lot of the recommendations that are in that uh, very long and practical, finally, document do apply for patient-generated health data, even in the context of real-world evidence. And so to conclude, um, I think that when, when we think about patient-generated health data, so our pizza, to go back to our initial example, and we see how it fits with gumbo, real-world evidence, we can think about that in terms of what's the same and what's different, just like anything else in life, I guess. And so there are things of patient-generated health data in the use of real-world evidence that are the same. It, for, uh, it, it's just the same as traditional real-world data. And uh, 
So questions of fit for purpose can be broken down in questions related to data relevancy and data quality. This uh, infographic here will be part of one of the white paper that will be released by the Duke Margolic uh, Initiative uh, in October. And um, so those, those are common. Those, we, don't, we don't need to find something new to deal with patient-generated health data if, if this list is uh, part of your decision making. So the notes that you see at the top, question 1B, question 2, 7B, is unfortunately something that is unintelligible for you because the handouts that you have has that uh, nomenclature removed. But uh, the first column is column A, the second column is column B, and then you number them from 0 to uh, 7. Uh, so uh, data relevancy and data quality are uh, already uh, covered there. I, I think that patient-generated health data, we need to think about, uh, the, 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 th the, th the thing we really need to harp on and the things that really come up on all these meetings are questions about the notorious V of big data. Veracity, variability. Those, like, can, can you trust this data? Can you, what about if people put the Fitbit on a dog? That's, that's the example that comes up all the time, right? And so those are, yes, they are very, very specific of uh, patient-generated health data, but they're not specific in terms of clinical research. Those are questions that also the people in clinical trials have to deal with, and they maybe have solved it. So I, I again, uh, point back to the city recommendations on some of these questions that are more general on how to use that data in clinical practice, and they are taking care there. The Fitbit on a dog is taking care there. Uh, and then there are um, questions, finally, that are specific to patient-generated health data in the specific context of RWE. There are new form of bias, there are new form of unmeasured confounders that we are not used to deal with in uh, RWE, and they are not broken by uh, randomization in clinical trials. So for instance, how the user interact with a UX, that's not something that we're used, in, in, uh, used to uh, understanding or, or capturing protocol, because the UX, usually it's you know, the physician or whatever system captures the, the data in claims, EHR, and the lab world. And uh, so I, I think that the box that's missing in the handout and the decision making, which is the box that talks about that in, 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 in the left hand side in the A column uh, on traditional uh, uh, RWD, uh, it's the box that talks about basically present bias. Are we sure that the person with that specific health outcome is going to show up? I think there is a correspondent in patient generated health data. Are we sure that people, when they feel bad, are still going to wear the device? There could be a censoring in the outcome, just exactly the same. And the last point I'm going to make is that I think there's a big missing box at the end of column B of patient-generated health data. How do you declare a fit for purpose? Well, a patient or the participant there has much more voice than it used to in traditional RWD. So if you think about these uh, pieces of data uh, as collected directly from the user for a specific question, you want that data use uh, to, be, uh, to be understood by the user. You want the data permission to be really clear uh, from the participant, the patient, or the user, and all these uh, uh, roles kind of merge in, uh, in this model. So add a box at the end, which is, do I have the right permission for data use? Thank you, everyone. Hopefully, we can make Gambo Pizza happen. Thank you, Luca.